This is the 28th Emeriti Lecture in a series. Uh, I'm Todd Whipke, president of the Emeriti Association that puts these lectures on. And the purpose of the lectures is to, uh, to present research that is performed by emeritus faculty after they retire. It's to show that they're remaining productive and uh, to share those results with the public and with other faculty and students. We want to thank Chancellor Blumenthal for supporting, financially supporting the series uh, and the refreshments that we'll consume afterwards. I'd also like to thank Alicia Burrs, who is the uh, event coordinator that helped put this, uh, all of the facilities and publicity together. And I'd like you to thank you for coming. Uh, and as you know, this, this series is, is videotaped. And so if you're interested in seeing uh, the lectures that appeared before this, you can just Google Emeriti, lecture, uh, Emeriti Lectures and uh, you, will find, you will find all of them uh, on both our website and on uh, YouTube. And I'd like to just put in a plug there that uh, <clears throat> it would be good if you would follow the Emeriti uh, page on YouTube and also on Facebook. Um, so because it is being videotaped, please silence your cell phones. Our Emeriti lecturer tonight is Dixon Professor Emeritus Chip Lord uh, from Film and Digital Media, and he will speak on Awakening from 20th Century Projects Engaged with Environmental Issues from 1970 until 2017. To make the introduction of uh, Professor Lord, I have invited John Weber, uh, who has known Chip from the very beginning when Chip was uh, just beginning in the visual arts program at UC San Diego in the early 80s. And Weber was completing his MFA at that time. Uh, a few words about John Weber. He began his career as a curator of contemporary art in Portland uh, at the Art Museum, uh, 1987 to 93, followed by a uh, serving as curator of education and public programs at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art until 2004. Then he moved to the opposite coast to be the Dayton director of the Francis Young Tang Teaching Museum and Art Gallery at Skidmore College in Saratoga, New York. Finally, in 2012, he returned to California uh, to UCSC as the founding director in the newly uh, envisioned Institute of Arts and Sciences. This is his current position. The IAS, the Institute for Arts and Sciences, uh, creates exhibitions and events that are linked to the university curriculum and teaching. Two recent events uh, you may have seen. The Crochet Coral Reef ex Exhibition at Cessnon Gallery and also at uh, Seymour Marine Discovery Center. And the recently opened 22 channel audio installation uh, entitled Forest uh, for a Thousand Years is at the Arboretum. It is uh, the work of two Canadian artists. John has also taught in the digital art and new media MFA program 
And without any further ado, John, let's welcome John Weber. Thanks. And I should say that when I, when Chip arrived at San Diego, at UC San Diego, when I was a grad student, he, he was already world famous by then. <laughs> so that was, he, his, it had begun even before that. <laughs> but it was a, a, honor, a pleasure to have him come there. So good evening. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here tonight to introduce Chip Lord, whose work I have admired from the first time I became aware of it, as you heard, uh, nearly 40 years ago. Chip has left a lasting impact on modern and contemporary art, both nationally and internationally. Coming out of Tulane University with a degree in architecture in 1968, he and a small group of colleagues formed a collective to create what they envisioned as a countercultural underground architecture. A friend of theirs reputedly responded, like an ant farm? The name stuck and the rest is history. From 1968 to 78, Chip and his colleagues created a string of works that are now in the history books, and you'll hear about some of them from him tonight, as well as very recent work. Um, I would like to mention just two pieces in that time period, however, because of this truly singular impact that they have left, imprint that they have left on American culture. In 2004, the eminent curator, Connie Llewellyn, wrote this about one of them titled Media Burn at the time of Ant Farm's Berkeley Art Museum retrospective that she organized. On July 4, 1975, in the parking lot of San Francisco's Cow Palace, two artists outfitted like astronauts crawled into the Phantom Dream Car, a customized 1959 Cadillac Biarritz complete with interior video communication, and drove at full speed through a pyramid of flaming TVs. Media Burn, a spectacular performance, and later a widely distributed videotape, was a literal collision of two American icons, the car and the television set. It remains one of the most celebrated and oft imitated pieces by the endlessly enterprising collective Ant Farm. Radical architects, video, performance, and installation artists, and above all, visionaries and cultural commentators. Now, cleverly, Chip was not actually inside the Phantom Dream Car at the moment of impact. I believe he was on the outside videotaping it for posterity, a much better place to be. <laughs> Later that year, Chip and his colleagues finished their most widely known work, Cadillac Ranch, a commission by the contemporary art collector Stanley Marsh, who paid them the munif munificent fee of $3,000 to create it. Five years later, and already an icon of American culture, Cadillac Ranch was further immortalized by Bruce Springsteen in the song of the same name. And Chip said he will be speaking a bit about Cadillac Ranch tonight. In 1978, a fire in Ant Farm, San Francisco studio, and the differing directions and interests of its core members signaled to them that it was time to close the collaboration. Since then, Chip, Chip Lord's work in both single channel video and video installation has been shown nationally and internationally. He's been featured in prestigious exhibitions such as the Whitney Biennial in New York, at the Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco, at Lon London's um, reputed ICA in Japan, and many more countries and places. In 2005, the Reina Sofia in Madrid, Spain's highly influential museum and gallery of contemporary art, presented a survey retrospective of his video work, including 12 works translated into Spanish. Throughout a long, productive career, his work has demonstrated a sharp awareness of American culture and a sense of humor that is both critical and refreshing. In the classroom, first at UC San Diego, uh, where, as you heard, I was a grad student when he arrived in the early 80s, and then here since 1989, um, he has been a valued and beloved professor, mentor, and colleague. UC Santa Cruz is fortunate to claim Chip Lord as an emeritus faculty member, and his critical, skeptical point of view and enthusiastic appetite for the absurdities of contemporary America have, I believe, been a, a perfect fit here. And speaking personally, um, I was teaching the, the MFA class for the Digital Art New Media uh, program this year, and Chip graciously hosted this year's graduating a cohort of MFA students in his studio in San Francisco to talk about his career and work. As I told them before our class trip, today you're going to hear from an artist who made two of the iconic works of late 20th century art. This is a unique privilege, and it's also going to be a pleasure. I say that to you. Please join me in welcoming and honoring Chip Lord, Professor Emeritus. OK. 
Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, John, for that introduction, and thank you, Todd, for organizing uh, tonight's talk. Um, it's an honor to, to give an Emeriti research lecture, and the, the work I'm premiering is the Santa Cruz premiere tonight, Miami Beach Elegy, is, uh, was supported by a uh, Dixon Emeriti Professorship Award from 2016. I'm very grateful for that uh, support also. I'm gonna digress uh, a little bit outside the rules uh, to give context to that work, Miami Beach Elegy. And I thought I would begin by explaining the title. Um, and especially since John mentioned the in relationship to the 20th, 20th century, but the title here is Awakening from the 20th Century. Um, it borrows, the title is borrowed from uh, Walter Benjamin, uh, and uh, of course the German philosopher, cultural critic, and essayist um, use this phrase to describe his Arcades project, which was a long and ongoing uh, research project into uh, emerging modernity in Europe at the beginning of the 20th century. And here's what he wrote. Every work of history must begin with awakening. This work is concerned with awakening from the 19th century. So my awakening from the 20th century was a video essay that explored transformations occurring in San Francisco during the rise of the technology uh, economy, the dot-com economy in the late 1990s, now 20 years ago. But to give some <clears throat> uh, context and background uh, to Miami Beach Elegy, I'm just gonna run through a brief uh, biography that might uh, highlight some of my, some influences and some, in a sense, uh, a sense of research. Uh, as John mentioned, I uh, studied architecture in the 1960s. There was no theory taught in architecture in those days, only history, and modernism was the um, dominant style, modernism and brutalism. And this building, the Boston City Hall, was the winning entry in a design competition in 1962, the year I began my, my studies. Uh, it wasn't completed until 1968, so that whole process paralleled my uh, education uh, in architecture. But the architectural curriculum at Tulane University could hardly keep up with the social, cultural, and artistic changes taking place during that decade. So many of my influences came from outside architecture. And of course, Andy Warhol was one of them, pop artist who turned to filmmaking, also a queer artist. In 1967 then, this book by Marshall McLuhan and Quentin Fiore, McLuhan, of course, also a philosopher, academic, public intellectual, but this presentation of his work was visual, and it was a collaboration with a graphic designer. And so I just wanted to show these shots of the interior of that book because it, it was like a huge um, wake up for me. 1968, of course, Martin Luther King was assassinated on April 4th, now 50 years ago, and Bobby Kennedy later that year in June, and also this was the year I graduated. And graduating in 1968, there was a, a feeling that there was revolution in the air. I, um, oh, additionally, the Whole Earth Catalog was published that year, the first Whole Earth Catalog, and this would uh, prove to be a kind of postgraduate curriculum for me, introducing the writing of Gregory Bateson, John Cage, and of course, Buckminster Fuller. Every Whole Earth Catalog began with something by Buckminster Fuller. So that summer, I drove my Volkswagen Beetle to San Francisco uh, to attend the Halperin workshop. 
This workshop was led by the uh, landscape architect Lawrence Halperin and his wife uh, Anna Halperin, the director of the dancers' workshop. And it introduced the idea of the city as an object, the city as a score, the, the idea of moving through the city as a form of performance. It also involved uh, collectivity and creative collaboration, as, as you can see from these pictures, which were uh, taken uh, at a beach above the Sea Ranch. Later that summer, my friend Doug Michaels, he was a graduate of the Yale School of Architecture, he arrived in um, San Francisco, and uh, I think John did a good job, probably better than I'm going to, telling the story of the founding of Ant Farm. Um, this friend gave us that name, but we immediately recognized it as a very good, not only a good name, but a, a perfect logo, and it came with an official color, only one color, green, which was appropriate. In some ways, uh, we probably wanted to be a rock band, but uh, none of us knew how to play any instruments. But this collaboration, uh, existed for 10 years and eventually led to the making of Cadillac Ranch in 1974. Um, I think the Cadillac Ranch came, came more out of lived experience that we shared as kids growing up in the 1950s. But it was also realized at a time, 1973 was of course the uh, OPEC oil embargo which created the first energy crisis in the U.S. So, <clears throat> while I do believe the, the sculpture is a fond way of looking back at these ridiculous cars that we loved so much as kids, it, uh, it also fit into a uh, critique of the gas guzzler and the automobile that was aligned with um, environmental issues of the day. And uh, for us, it was also an evolutionary diagram, a di uh, an illustration that we, we found. A actually, it was used by Cadillac in a print advertisement. Um, but as an evolutionary diagram, it shows the rise and the fall of the Cadillac tail fin. I, I uh, recently read an interview with the Mexican artist Damien Ortega. In 2002, he created this work, Cosmic Thing, and it's a literal uh, three-dimensional construction of what might be an illustration in a parts catalog. Um, Ortega said this about his work. He said, I love the idea of the work itself being more intelligent than I am, uh, it, it going beyond and taking on a life of its own. And this is exactly how I feel about Cadillac Ranch too. after uh, 44 years later. So, <coughs> uh, I want to show quickly uh, three projects from the 1970s by Ant Farm, each one having a relationship to environmental concerns and the, the rise of the environmental movement. And of, of course, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's eerie to see uh, Beijing in 2014 grappling with smog and uh, pollution created by uh, vehicles as they push a rise into uh, a fossil fuel uh, economy. So <clears throat> the first piece was done in 1970. It was called Gas Station. And it was a performance on the campus of the University of Southern California during a conference um, put on by Experiments in Art and Technology. Um, we designed uh, an event in which uh, a cake was decorated like a tire and sat at the center of this inflatable, also tire-like form. And the ant farm performers then donned uh, gas masks, army surplus gas masks, and we took a highway safety flare, lit it, and put it in the cake. The lights were turned down, 
And for the next 15 minutes, which was the duration of the highway flare, we projected slides of gas stations on the wall of this uh, classroom. Um, that was it. When the, when the flare went out and the lights came back up, the room was empty. Uh, the, <clears throat> during this period of time, Amfarm was also experimenting with lightweight, uh, either inflatable or air-supported structures. Uh, so it was a form of architectural experimentation. It was also, I realized later, uh, symbolically the opposite of, of brutalism, what we had studied in our architectural curriculums. So when we were invited by, uh, I guess by the University of California at Berkeley, uh, to participate in the first Earth Day, 1970, April 1970, on Sproul Plaza. We came with an inflatable, but we, but we designated it as a clean air pod. We had these uh, white lab coats, which gave us a certain kind of authority, and we also had a battery-powered megaphone, and we would periodically announce, there's an air emergency, everybody into the clean air pod. Uh, which was not actually technically filtering the air in any way. <laughs> However, it was, I think the point was made when it appeared in the Oakland Tribune um, the next day. And this was also the year when, um, in Tokyo, vending machines, vending oxygen were starting to, to show up and be deployed. And, you know, later that year, 1970, the, during the Nixon administration, the e Environmental Protection Agency was um, uh, formed. The final project from this uh, uh, sequence was um, <clears throat> initiated because of, and this is maybe the one that's most connected to scientific uh, work, uh, because scientists in 1973 or 74, and it was actually a team of UC scientists, uh, chemists, I believe, um, discovered that the propellant in aerosol cans, the uh, chlorofluoromethane, was uh, in fact destroying the ozone layer of the atmosphere. And <clears throat> this uh, led to uh, legislative hearings, and uh, fairly quickly, the uh, aerosol cans or the propellant uh, were banned. So it was a, a successful example of science doing the hard work leading to changing of the law. So uh, to memorialize this moment, we thought uh, the proper kind of uh, object would be a time capsule and that we would make a time capsule called aerosol arsenal. And um, we'd, we would go out, and which we did, and purchase um, aerosol cans before they were taken off the shelves of supermarkets. Um, we neglected to think about when this time capsule might be open, but you can get from a sense of the titles here, uh, I think, again, a connection to the, the post-war years when the idea of Everything should be easy, housework should be easy, take the drudgery out, and the aerosol spray can was a part of that. Um, we never were able to show the aerosol arsenal uh, publicly, but, and then um, we had a fire at our studio in 1978, and that was the, uh, in which it was destroyed. So now I'm going to jump uh, forward across, I guess, uh, a number of years, <clears throat> basically um, to, to introduce Miami Beach Elegy. And I, I took on a, a research project, and in some sense the sixth extinction by Elizabeth Colbert was, was the center of that, but um, quickly... Uh, so many other works in the last eight to ten years have come out um, exploring climate change as an issue, and rightfully so, because um, after all, it is a, a wicked and huge problem. I'm going to, uh, I want to just uh, highlight uh, a talk that Elizabeth Colbert gave uh, in October 
And um, it was the second annual Jonathan Shell Memorial Lecture on the Fate of the Earth, an event uh, established by the Nation Institute uh, in honor of the late Jonathan Shell. The text for this talk can be found at uh, thenewyorker.com. In this talk, um, Elizabeth Colbert begins by describing the end or the <clears throat> very likely extinction of the Rab's fringe-limbed tree frog uh, habitat native to central Panama. This species of tree frog was, was only discovered in 2005 and only named in 2008. And now, a few years later, this particular, according to Elizabeth Colbert, this particular tree frog, when he died, he was the last um, Rab's fringe-limbed uh, tree frog. And one thing she said in that talk, but particularly struck me. She said that, uh, she, uh, she said biologists were trying to catalog what was out there before it was lost. So that, that phrase, trying to catalog, catalog what was out there before it was lost, um, struck me because I think it, in a way, was also the basis of my project and my interest in Miami Beach. After all, Miami Beach uh, can be seen as the canary in the mine shaft of climate change. It also bears a kind of interesting relationship to that formative decade of my life, the post-war uh, decade, in the sense that th there was a great development boom in the 1950s in Miami Beach. Uh, this is the Fountain Blue Hotel, which was built in 1952 designed by Morris Lapidus. And I think it's easy to see that it was really the 1959 Cadillac of hotel design. So I, <clears throat> I wanted to simply catalog what was there in 2016 before the sea rose and took it away. And that's, that's what we're going to uh, now uh, see. Tides are leading to flooded streets all across Miami Beach and also parts of Fort Lauderdale where some drivers stalled out. CBS 4's Gary Nelson is live on Miami Beach and how it's looking right there. Gary. Well, if it's uh, Tuesday, it must be another king tide flooding here on Miami Beach. We're on Indian uh, Trace Terrace uh, here on the beach, which is uh, closed to vehicular traffic right now and the reason is it's right next to the intercoastal waterway here you can see the water there the tide rises it floods this street rendering it impassable by vehicles there are some other uh, streets in the area Collins and whatnot that also have some standing water but cars are able to get through the bad news is you're going to experience this again certainly on Miami Beach and when it's a particularly bad tide like this and parts other parts of South Florida. The good news for Miami Beach residents is lots of help is on the way. For a third straight day, much of Miami Beach was awash in flood waters born of a king tide, the result of an extraordinary alignment of the earth and the moon that saw residents and tourists taking to bicycles, cars stranded in water above the running boards. It's a phenomenon beach residents have walked through knee deep for decades but are still infuriated with. The bad news, it's going to happen again tonight, tomorrow, and the next time the moon and tides conspire for misery. Some streets that previously would have been inundated were dry today. Now, uh, Miami Beach is in the middle, two years into a five-year plan, three, four hundred million dollar plan to install 
pumping stations uh, to correct this problem. For now, we're live on Miami Beach. Gary Nelson.
two, three. Turn it a little bit more. Oh, there we go. There we go. One, two, three. Good. Good. Mostly clear with temperatures in the lower 80s. I'm Al Lewis. Get a check on the traffic at Donis Lugo in Miami's Magic City Casino Traffic Center. Looks like we have an object blocking the left lane of the northbound turnpike south of Griffin Road. Also an accident blocking your left lane northbound turnpike approaching 112th Avenue. Support brought to you by Casper Sleep Tire. I'm sitting in holiday travel traffic.
John is going to come up and uh, join me to moderate the question and answer period. So we have someone with a roving mic, I think, somewhere. Roving mic there. Thank you. Thank you. I guess Beautiful. it's the moderator's job to ask the first question. Okay. <laughs> well, um, well, I'm really interested in how you use the, um, the soundtrack together with the images so and sort of knitting them together. Beach and how it's sort of looking a different. Right talk a little bit about the music and how you well, picked it. Well, if it's uh, the, Tuesday, the it must be yeah. another King uh, Tide flooding The music is by a, a young uh, composer and musician uh, who uh, we did one project uh, on previous beach, to this called Greetings from Amarillo. He lives in Amarillo. And three years ago, he called me out of the blue and introduced himself and asked if I would consider making a video to go with an album he uh, had created. His, his music, uh, he's not a singer-songwriter, so it's all... Uh, uh, no lyrics, and for that reason, I thought it lent itself to uh, working. Maybe the visuals would provide the narrative. For this project, um, I worked with uh, his music again, but it was it was not specifically composed for the film. However, this was a this was another project for him, and it was a more experimental. Uh, there was it just seemed like it was a there was a lot of. Um, emotional content to that music and it could it could be um it, it could be work work with this footage mm -hmm. great uh question there can we get the the mic over there and we're videotaping it so we need to get the question into the microphone <clears throat> from much of the uh video of people was the camera hidden? Did people see a person with a camera looking at them, or was it hidden in some way? Got that? Can, could they see the camera? Yeah. Was the camera hidden? Could they, did, yeah. did they know it, the, the camera wasn't hidden, but um, uh, part of this was shot on the iPhone. The, the smaller <laughs> inset shots uh, I shot with, uh, on my iPhone with a, um, a steady uh, uh, gimbal, and it's possible to walk with the camera like this and people just don't notice the camera. So the shot where we're going into the hotel, for example, um, it was just a coincidence that the woman walked right in front of me and she became a kind of perfect example of uh, hotel guests in Miami Beach, you know. So <clears throat> it it's this is, of course, uh, related to ideas about street photography and the ethics of street photography. So, in other words, the camera is never actually hidden, but, um, you know, I want, I want it to be a natural representation. But to give another example, um, we uh, just came upon this, uh, these realtors convention. They, it was lunchtime. They were pouring out of the... Jackie Gleason uh, Fillmore Auditorium, it's called, and uh, they had this balloon of the earth, and I thought this is such a great metaphor, uh, the branding of Caldwell Banker on the balloon. But of course, all these people wanted to be photographed with the <laughs> balloon, and there we were, my cinematographer with the video camera on a tripod. And so it was just a, a moment of free, like a free fire zone, you know, <laughs> with a camera. Um, and the goal is all, always to, to represent something as being natural, you know, being, but of course, like any film, it's completely controlled in the editing in terms of time and sound, and so many choices are made and to, um, to the adds, adds meaning to um, the shots. There, there were no reenactments. <laughs> uh, question up on top there, and then the second mic can go over to there for the next one. The word Cadillac was clear on the umbrellas, but was the choice of Cadillacs and Bentleys in homage to Cadillac Ranch? The, the Cadillac was on the umbrella, but then you, you panned across yeah. the Cadillacs. Is that yes, yeah, yeah. Um, 
I, and actually there's an earlier shot uh, of the Cadillac dealership. Um, that's one of the few shots where we went back to the mainland. <laughs> Uh, there's no Cadillac dealer in Miami Beach, but I saw an ad on TV and I thought, you know, uh, growing up, I, I grew, up, grew up in St. Petersburg, not in Miami, but I grew up in Florida. Um, and um, I, of course, the Cadillac as a status symbol was, you know, an obvious uh, thing. And I hadn't seen that many Cadillacs in one place. So <laughs> that shot, we just did a drive through of the, the yard of uh, the dealership. So that was the initial one. So then the Cadillac Hotel, the, the umbrella shot was kind of a way to echo that or resonate it. Mm -hmm. Is there a question there? Thank you. Hi, Chip. Uh, one of the big questions that I'm dealing with is the huge contradiction that the architects of our future are putting out there for us to think about. The first one is that the prediction that 90% of the human population will flock to the urban areas, and many of those urban areas are right on the ocean. And the second one is the global warming and rising of the sea. How do they reconcile this problem? The no. question that, that um, prediction that 90% of the population is going to flock to urban areas, and most of those urban areas are near the water, and the waters are going to rise. How do they, and I'm not sure which they you mean, how do they reconcile? What? Yeah. Oh, how do architects reconcile this problem? All the people will be where the yeah. water is going to come. Yeah. In. Well, I, I can't speak for the architects, really. <laughs> um, and certainly, if the they refers to uh, you know, the powers that be of Miami Beach, right? Um, the mayor actually ran on a platform of solving the flooding problem. <laughs> if you remember the beginning, the newscaster, how to deal with this problem, you know. Um, I'm sure the mayor of Miami Beach knows, uh, doesn't doubt climate change, but he's also a politician, so for three or four hundred million dollars, this scheme of pumping the water back out into Biscayne Bay, it kind of works because it only, you only have to pump during high tide and you can uh, mitigate the rising water in the streets and then the tide goes back down. But of course it's a Band-Aid. Um, and um, you know, Florida has a climate denying governor and it, it's, it's a contentious issue. But the city of Miami and many other cities have now uh, a post of sustainability. And um, I, I went to an architect's conference actually that was held there in Miami Beach and um, the sustainability officer did speak at that. So there are people thinking about that, but you know, I, it's not the developers, because the, the developers can get their money back uh, as soon as every condominium in the building is sold. So they really probably don't care. You know, they're gonna get their money back within a few years. Um, so that's a very interesting question and uh, you know, I'm not an expert. <laughs> Question right there, uh, microphone. Um, <clears throat> I was interested when you mentioned very briefly the red leg, this red fog. Uh, then wonder why you were focusing it, but were you aware that it has just recently reappeared uh, across Heller Drive? Uh, and uh, it's now an endangered species. species. So that red frog has just appeared across Heller Drive and is now an invasive species. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that same one from Panama? Is that the same? Is it the same? Species? Is it? No, it's not. Oh, oh, disagreement. No, it's yeah. not the same species. We have, a, we have the wrong red frog? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, um, I urge you to uh, read the, the text of Elizabeth Colbert's talk uh, because she goes on in that talk to describe that the, there is a, a fungus that has killed a, a lot of frogs, many different species of frogs um, in Central America. And um, 
it's a uh, f fungus or a virus that is very likely been uh, transmitted by unknowingly by humans, uh, you know, who have brought it on their, their flight back from wherever they were. And, um, but she addresses that sort of question of the way that um, so many species are now have been uh, migrated unintentionally by human activity and human travel um, and uh, tourism. Um, and uh, in her, her talk, she also used some very interesting um, metrics of uh, measurements of the biomass of uh, wild species, total biomass of wild species compared to the biomass of domestic animals. Um, and it was something like a ratio, or I can't remember, 10 to 1. Uh, so <clears throat> um, I just think that's where to go to get more of, of that story. Okay, uh, uh, question up there. Um, actually, we've got three more. Uh, let's go up on, I saw the hand up on top there, yeah. And then over there, and then to Jim after that, and then over to that side. So up, up top in the middle, hand there, yep. Uh, you, you, you're first there, there, no, no, you, you. Yeah, you, you, you. I couldn't help thinking how great it would be to have this playing on, uh, on cable TV in Miami Beach. What are your plans with the film going forward? What are your plans going forward? He'd love to see it on cable TV in Miami Beach. <laughs> I've been trying to get a screening in Miami Beach. I don't have it secured it yet, but um, I'm also working on a project about Phoenix. And um, I'm working with the same musician. It's a series of songs. Uh, we've, we've shot the footage in, in Phoenix. It's a much different project because it's... Uh, a more complicated issue of sustainability, the city of Phoenix. Um, so that's, <clears throat> that's the most immediate project that I'm involved in. Okay, question there, uh, Jim? Jim. Uh, so Chip, I was interested in how you uh, represented um, Armageddon. <laughs> uh, i.e., you didn't represent Armageddon. You, all of this, it's, a, it's an elegy, so in theory, in pr by definition, everything we will see, or much that we will see, is going to be swept away. But you didn't make a disaster film, and you, and you didn't have anything in the film that was a violent uh, erasure or sweeping away but you had mm, sand castles and you had children in waves and you had a whole series of dissolves, of image dissolves, you know, where the images would be sort of washed away. Exactly. And, and so uh, that's just, a, that to me, I, I just wondered how you were thinking about that. I mean, you, you, you represented the erosion <laughs> of the ocean in these very subtle ways, not in any violent or dramatic way. And I wondered, um, that's a, a kind of an observation and, and an appreciation, but I'm wondering how you thought, how you thought through uh, the, the challenge of representing this absolutely epical process that was going on. Yeah, I think that was the challenge. And in fact, um, I scheduled the trip there uh, for the most likely high tide, king tide period in October. And of course we got there and the street was not flooded. So suddenly here was the dilemma, how do you, how do you show the flooding? So uh, the, the street that uh, is featured in the news account at the beginning, which is where we went, uh, it has a guardrail and there's about three feet and then there's a seawall and that it's not the intercoastal waterway, as the reporter said, but it's rather a part of an inlet from the ocean. Uh, what the city has done is built another sea law right behind the guardrail to add about 18 inches. So 
One strategy was that we shot at low tide, and we went back at high tide and did the dissolve to show the water coming over the original seawall. Um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, it was a, uh, it, it, for me, it was a matter of finding metaphors of, uh, that could represent being washed away. And of course, uh, <laughs> the day we were shooting on the beach, Unfortunately, the tide was going out, so we had the young woman building the, the sand castle. This, to me, was a perfect metaphor, but it, was, it wasn't ever going to get fully wiped out, you know. So, uh, but I'm glad you, you pointed to the, just the, the element of using the dissolve to bring the water on top of the buildings, because that was another way to suggest that idea. And um, <clears throat> I mean, it's w within a certain aesthetic, uh, you know, obviously it could be done with uh, computer graphics or special effects or building models. Or, and, um, you know, I think it's, you know, this is the way I wanted to do it, you know, and working with reality, working from reality and doing the best that you could. Um, I, there's another, the, another shot of the, uh, the young mother with her two kids. And, uh, it's, you know, it's a little drama, right? And she obviously doesn't want to be there. The kids are loving the water. But you can see how easily that little boy could just be washed out to sea, right? Uh, so I love that shot because it embodied that sense of the drama. You have the people in the background who are just, you know, uh, loving the waves. Uh, and yet... The point was to show there's a power there. There's always the power of the ocean to destroy. Um, so, Great. Um, there and then into the middle after that. I, I think my question probably overlaps with the previous one a little bit. Um, but I can see the connection between the award-winning design that you showed in the slides before the video, the architectural design, with the hotels in your video. And I was just wondering if you could spell out what that connection means to you. The connection between the hotels and the video and the architectural designs of earlier. I think, I think that was it. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> we're not sure we got the question, but th this area of the mid-beach mid section of Miami Beach, of course, the South Beach area was the first area developed and it has all the Art Deco buildings and it's, it's now a historic um, district. The, the mid-beach was more interesting to me architecturally because it has, um, the, Miami is starting to see, well, it's been going on for a few years, uh, you know, world-class architects coming in and designing condominium projects. In fact, um, uh, Norman Foster designed the one with the kind of the curved white balconies. Uh, it's a condominium building next to a hotel that's developed by an Argentine multimillionaire. Uh, but one thing that was, I was just shocked by when I went there was to see all the white buildings against the blue sky. It was so striking. And I don't think they have any, you know, uh, regulations that you must paint your hotel white. But in that stretch, uh, that's, that's why we focus and shot mostly in that area. Um, Many things were sort of gifts. We were just shooting the m very early in the morning and working our way up the beach, and suddenly we came to the, these, the uh, trucks and the movement of the sand, and that was like a huge construction site. And um, my cinematographer, Chris Beaver, uh, found, I mean, just by his instinct, found the shot of the, the guy who was picking up the garbage by hand you see him just talk, looking on his cell phone and, you know, taking a break with the, all the tractors, the dump trucks behind him. It was such a nice uh, shot because it combined both of those, uh, those activities. And um, so I was very happy to get the, the, the labor of the individual cleaning the beach as well as the machine. And... We had to get up before the sun came up to go out there when the, the really uh, the big tractor was manicuring the beach. Um, so, you know, in a sense, I was able to use my architectural training as an eye, 
At one point, I, I said to Chris, wait, I want, we want to get shots just perfectly lined up from the ocean looking back at each of these hotels. So he, di he didn't have that awareness. So that's sort of an example of, of uh, the architectural eye and how, how it could be used. Um, it was beautiful to be there. <laughs> we never went in the ocean. We never sunbathed or did any. We were working the whole time, but it was... Uh, Beautiful and horrifying because of, of uh, the rising sea level. I was thinking, sort of, just another nice day in Pompeii. <laughs> um, now, yeah, is yeah. it Karen? Is that there? on? Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much, Chip. What struck me uh, in the piece was this juxtaposition, I think others have talked about it, between pleasure and catastrophe. And it seems that in your uh, visual imagination that the car mediates that somehow, because the car was such an important part of, of your work in general and this piece. So I wondered if you could speak a bit about that juxtaposition of pleasure and catastrophe and how the car uh, signifies that for, for you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, the, uh, the car is my spirit uh, object, <laughs> I guess. Uh, and uh, at the same time, um, I really look forward to the end of the car, especially the gasoline-powered individual conveyance, um, uh, which, you know, in our lifetimes, we're not going to see the end of it. That's pretty obvious. But um, I think w with this project, uh, it was another way of, you know, there had to be cars in it because that's part of what you do in Miami Beach. You know, you get, find yourself stuck in traffic you know, inching along uh, Collins Avenue. So even though that's a very sort of mundane shot, you know, to me it was important to include that and juxtapose it with uh, other shots that are more classically, you know, beautiful and natural, let's say. Okay, we take one more question and then um, we'll be able to talk uh, individually with Chip at the reception. Okay, thank you. Just a change of gears here. Um, the stack of books that you showed, the books that influence you, that you've read, that uh, point to the future, um, to me, they all lead back in an indirect way to uh, Ant Farm's uh, Dolphin Embassy, and uh, which I think was absolutely prescient in the 70s, if we look at the work here at this institution of Haraway and Singh, um, and interspecies communication. Um, but yet it doesn't, it seems to have fallen off the map of uh, Ant Farm's uh, uh, history. So is that project that you're, has anybody traced the genealogy of that project up through the decades? There's a question about Dolphin Embassy, which he sees oh. is so prescient for all these other things, all the books you showed, he thinks could go back to Dolphin Embassy and what's going yeah. on with that? <laughs> has it fallen out of oh. the, the oeuvre or something? Um. The Dolphin Embassy was an ant farm uh, project, and uh, it actually led to the demise of Ant Farm uh, when one partner left to go to Australia to, to realize the Dolphin Embassy. It was never realized. It was uh, more of a conceptual, making a, a con conceptual intervention, let's say, in uh, the idea of interspecies communication. Um, the, I, and the chief idea of the Dolphin Embassy was it would be better to go out in the ocean and invite the dolphins to enter the embassy. Um, and it was designed so that they could, they could actually come onto the, the ship. Um, it's, um, the, the interest remains in it, and um, we, we did do a, a project um, two years ago uh, that was at the Chicago Architectural Biennial. Uh, it was a collaboration with an, uh, an architecture firm in New York, and the idea was to sort of revisit the Dolphin Embassy. And um, in that case, we sort of ran out of time and resources to really take the idea to an appropriate level of 21st century thinking. So, yeah, that's about all I can say about it. <laughs> it could still happen. <laughs> well, congratulations, Chip, on your maritime lecture you, and your project. And please join me in thanking 
uh, Chip, Lord. Thank you.